when social media, well, social media has been big for a while, but I know when I first started getting into it quite heavily was in about 2015, 2016, Snapchat was new to the market <clears throat> and it was blowing up all over the place. And, you know, it was all about having these 10 second stories that, um, you know, enabled you to, you know, communicate in, in, in these small little sound bites. And I remember when I first got on Snapchat, <clears throat> completely oblivious to the culture of the platform, um, I would get on every morning and I'd do like, you know, 15 or 16 Snapchats in a row. You know, just talking about a concept for, you know, and then shooting it and keep going and keep, you know, and then 16 Snapchats later, you know, I'd produce, let's call it a minute and a half, two minutes of content. And then after my first couple of weeks on Snapchat, I, I remember going back to all the content and going, fuck, why are, why are people only watching the first couple of videos? They're not, they're not really watching past the first three videos and there's a massive decline. And it was at that point I realized, I was like, oh, fuck. People actually don't go to Snapchat to watch a two and a half minute video. They go to Snapchat to watch out at that t- at that time. It was a ten second video, and then I remember thinking to myself, going, "Well, how the fuck do I say something interesting in ten seconds?" And that that in itself became the challenge. And it was like, right, how do we communicate something really interesting within a ten second framework to be able to engage them enough to want to go through to that you know that next story? And uh, I remember when I went from doing sixteen snaps at a time to doing one snap you know, every hour, every hour and a half, my consumption went through the roof uh, because I was trying to communicate really effectively, but I was also opening loops that I wasn't closing and that people had to come back an hour or an hour and a half in order to be able to close. And it had a massive impact. But I guess when you then, um, you know, you zoom out from the Snapchat perspective, maybe into the YouTube perspective or the Facebook or the Instagram perspective, which is a little bit more like the Snapchat perspective, how do we organize our communication in a way where we maximize the potential for engagement ongoing, not just necessarily in that moment? So you, you, you remind me of so many things. I, ha- I constantly have to remind myself, like, what are the things that I have to say and what's the question that you ask that I have to uh, uh, put my thoughts into? Um, so here's the thing. Generally... Because the brain is all about solving puzzles mm. and, and kind of finding meaning and so on, puzzles work. Uh, if you can uh, create a thought that leaves a question at the end that is interesting enough that someone wants to resolve, you can carry them for a few more steps with you. Uh, that's kind of one, one way. It's hard to do that. So uh, putting a puzzle in short time that uh, I'm calling it puzzle, but it would be like a question is a tough thing, but if you can do that and some people are able to do that and I'll give you one tip to how it's uh, often pop- working for people, then this is one way. Another thing I, I wanted to say is that uh, people go to different medium with an expectation. So Snapchat, you're right, 10 seconds is what's expected. When people turn a uh, YouTube and they see an ad, they expect the ad to deliver a message in five seconds because after five seconds, the skip ad appears. So they give you five seconds and you have to convince them to stay the six. Uh, when people listen to a politician speak, they actually are okay with a few minutes. I think it's usually five minutes if it's a speech, not like on TV. Five minutes before an idea comes up. So they let politicians, they give them kind of a grace period of three minutes to just start and build an idea before they do it. Uh, when you watch a company CEO presenting the new product, think of uh, Steve Jobs presenting the new iPhone, uh, you know, one of those kind of uh, events, people are actually okay uh, even with uh, up to nine minutes of uh, you talking without us knowing where it's going. So each medium has its own kind of time. And, and every person from your audience who is interested in communicating an idea also should think, what is the medium I'm, I'm using for that? If you're the same message trying to send in Snapchat, YouTube, an ad on TV or via speech, you will get different uh, times. And I, and I promised an answer and I'm going to close the loop as before. I promised a specific way that actually uh, works across the board uh, multiple times in giving people a suspenseful moment that they are uh, going to stay with. And that is uh, rhetoric questions. Turns out that uh, if you're giving a speech but you ask a rhetoric question and you take a pause after that, many people in the audience are actually answering it in their mind. And then when you answer it, the first thing they do is either if they said the same thing you say, they tap on their shoulder and say, oh, I knew it. Like I thought the same thing that he or she are saying, they're happy. If not, 
they are even more engaged because now you kind of violated their expectations. So they they now want to know the answer. And either way, they spend time answering your question in their mind. It's very in, so if you look at engagement after a rhetoric question, there's usually a spike in engagement. Everyone in their mind is answering it. So a lot of uh, politicians do that often. They basically give a speech. There's no interaction. It's it's them on the podium talking to the audience. But they say, what kind of world do you want? A world where this happens or all the death happens? And they take a pause of 10 seconds. And everyone thinks, I want this world. And they say, well, I'm offering you that world. world. And this thing is a moment of peak engagement. It's not suspenseful in the sense, it's not like a detective story where you kind of say, okay, is it the butler or not? People are not suspenseful in, because they say, okay, I want to know the answer. But you actually got them to pause for a second and do something that everyone else is doing in their mind at the same time. And this shared experience is working and keeping people engaged for a few more seconds. So I've I um I've been taking a lot of notes or little little bullet points whilst you've been going through to try and I guess construct the ultimate formula for delivering a a message that's going to get through. And here's what I've got so far. And so from what I've heard you say, one of the most important things when it comes to delivering a strong message that's going to get through is it it needs to start with being simple. Because the more simple it is, the more easily that that brain, that reptilian brain is going to be able to absorb it. But it's also important from what you've said to be able to ask questions or open loops that creates a level of curiosity whereby you start to feed that curiosity with stories that are interesting and perhaps entertaining that leads them to a question or a puzzle that they're unsure how to solve that is ultimately closed by closing out the loop and the question that was originally asked. That's perfect. Let me add two more. Oh, please. I was, this is what I was waiting for. What's missing? <laughs> uh, one I would add is uh, control your voice. That is also really powerful. If you're in theater, uh, they spend a lot of time on just oh, deciding tonality. yeah. when I would raise my voice or lower it. This is kind of advanced. And but that's, cri- that's actually critical because as a speaker, I can I can say for a fact, the more monotone you are, the more people, even if the content's really interesting and really thought provoking, they'll drain out. And it's almost like it needs that level of inflection, that that vocal variety. So because it's unexpected, I'm assuming, is that is that what it is that engages people? Yes, it is. It's, it's basically showing them that uh, there is something that they don't know that's coming. They did not know this is coming. It tells them exactly mm-hmm. when they should care, when they should not. It's it's uh, making them kind of wake up if if they're kind of dr- losing you because you kind of increase the volume and so on. It, it controls a lot of variables that people are not uh, using on day to day experience. Most times when people talk, they just keep the same voice. By doing that, you kind of express that this is a different talk than just a conversational, uh, you know, one, one-to-one regular chat. It's different. A side note to that would be that if you're presenting visually, the body is also a tool that you have. Mm-hmm. The decision whether you move or not, whether you look someone in the eyes or not, whether you use your hands or not, all of those are decisions that, that it's not that there's a correct or incorrect one, but it has to be decided upon. If you decide to move, why? Is it because you want to kind of say that this spot on the stage is where I talk about the bad things and I'm moving to this spot and I'm talking about the good things? And people in their mind associate that I'm here talking about good things and I'm going here to tell them what's bad and back again, do you create this thing or not? Do you, uh, uh, with your hands, actually create, like if you say there's three things and you create a kind of hierarchy that this is the top one, this is the bottom one, you can say three things. So all of those things are decisions to make. They're not, they shouldn't be arbitrary. That those are all in one, and I give you another one that's uh, really common and, and important in the world of business. Uh, people many times in the world of business give the customer, the audience numbers, but the audience or the customer doesn't know what to make of those numbers. I'll give you a clear example. If I say uh, using this uh, drug makes people uh, decrease their uh, smoking by ninety percent, you don't know. Yet, if it's a lot or little, and if I say, which is a lot, now you know. So me just saying, this drug makes people drop their uh, desire to smoke by 90%, and if I say, which is very little, so for the same numbers, I now gave you what I want you to take. So a lot of times people give you the numbers without helping you interpret that, and then people would pick up later what it meant, but without the interpretation, 
many times people just kind of keep afloat the the number and they don't yet know if i say there's an increase in number of cuts in a movie uh, in the last couple of years to 1000 cuts okay which is a lot compared to movies in the 1930s which only had 20 cuts now you know okay people cut movies more so so i think that it's important to not stay with just the number but also give people as easy as possible interpretation digest it for them mm. Like you don't want to have a person stuck calculating things when you kind of move on in your talk. You want to make it easy for your audience. There you have it, guys. Thanks for tuning in to Unstoppable with me, your host, Kerwin Ray. And please do not forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel where you get to see all of these interviews in the flesh. Share this podcast with your friends. I would love to hear what you guys think. Thanks for joining us.